Good morning, everybody. A very warm welcome to our first uh, construction and engineering webinar of 2022, which is our spring uh, update on construction law. My name is Stefan Harris Wright. I'm a partner at Burkitt Solicitors and I head up the firm's construction and engineering team. Could I have the next slide, please? So hopefully most of you will have heard of us before, but just in case you haven't, there's some information at a glance up on this slide in case you want to look at it afterwards. Uh, I won't give you the hard sell, but just to summarize a few key points about us. So we are a full service law firm with offices in something of a uh, diamond formation, if you like, across the east of England. So we're in Cambridge, Chelmsford, Ipswich and Norwich. And uh, we also have an office in London. Can I have the next slide, please? So I will take the opportunity now to introduce you to our speakers for this morning. So first of all, we have Sophie Thornley. Sophie is a senior associate in our construction team based in Cambridge. Also joined by Sam Greenhouse. Sam is a legal director in our employment team in our Norwich office. And uh, last but by no means least is my colleague, Stephen Williams, who is a solicitor in our construction team, also based in Norwich. Next slide, please. So just to briefly summarize what it is we're going to cover during this morning's session. First of all, Sophie's going to talk about labor and materials shortages, uh, the market position on that and contractual treatment of those issues under popular industry standard forms of contract. Sam's going to talk about managing staff absence in the construction sector. And then Stephen's going to give us an update on some recent cases. And we'll finish off with some time for a Q&A at the end uh, of the presentation. So on the Q&A, there will be an opportunity for you to put your questions to our panel through the chat function in the GoToWebinar portal, which we are using this morning. Um, the questions, just to clarify, they come through to me and not to all delegates. So it's not like the Teams chat function where everybody sees what comes in. So you will remain anonymous and, and please don't be shy. Uh, there's no such thing as a, as a stupid question, as they say. Quite a few of you have sent questions in in advance, so many thanks for those. We'll definitely get through as many as we can in the time available. Uh, we've had a fantastic turnout for this session, which is great. Uh, I couldn't help but notice there's a real sort of international flavor to the guest list today. I worked out that we've got five out of seven continents represented. Uh, the only ones we don't have were South America and Antarctica. So um, very good turnout, so thanks for that. Uh, I can't promise we'll get through all the questions, but we'll definitely do our best, and I will wrap things up by midday. A couple of other final housekeeping points. Uh, the session is being recorded and will get circulated to delegates afterwards along with uh, a copy of the slides. So can I have the next slide, please? And without further ado, I will hand you over to Sophie to tell us all about the current position on labor and materials. Sophie. Thanks, Stefan. So it's not going to be news to any of them that uh, any of you that several factors have conflated to create a perfect storm materials have been affected by the supply chain crisis as a result of the pandemic border issues of brexit and now russia's invasion of ukraine labor shortages that were prevalent pre-pandemic and brexit are now a lot more acute the flow of workers back to the eu and the costs of employing migrant workers have skyrocketed all the workers have retired, not been replaced, and a few people have been rather unwell in the last two years. So the result is that the construction industry, like many other industries, is really wrestling with product and labor availability issues. Transport, um, labor, material issues are all um, resulting in an inevitable inflation to prices. And this is leading to not only delay, but also price increases across the board. So when costs unavoidably rise or there's a delay in a contract as a result of unavailability of materials, the general rule where there's no mechanism for pain sharing is that the price difference and the responsibility for delay lies with the contractor and its subcontractors. So I'm going to look today at the mechanisms available to deal with such matters contractually under the JCT and NEC contracts. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, under a JCT contract, the obvious place to look first is uh, the relief available to a contractor under the relevant events, which give you time but not money, and relevant matters, which give you time and money mechanisms. 
Neither of these expressly covers material or labour shortages. A contractor might try to argue that shortages fall under the force majeure provisions, which is a relevant event allowing for time but not additional money. However, force, a force majeure event isn't defined under an ACT contract, but is seen to be one that is truly exceptional and couldn't be contemplated by the parties at the time of contract. So obviously back in a few years ago, March 2020, COVID was generally accepted to be a force majeure event. And now I think a contractor might, might be successful if a contract was entered into prior to COVID and they could argue that um, material shortages are caused by COVID and therefore that the force majeure threshold is met. But obviously, the further we go on as time marches on, um, that argument becomes more and more remote. And it's always worth bearing in mind that um, the fact that contract performance has become more expensive or more difficult is not sufficient on its own to allow a force majeure claim. So I think that we need to really look at the other contractual options available to a contractor seeking relief. Firstly, with regards to uh, material shortages, some JCT contracts require a contractor to use materials of certain kinds or standards insofar as they are procurable. So this suggests that a contractor might not be penalised if certain materials are not available. In such circumstances, the contractor can request an instruction from the employer as to how to deal with the unavailability, and then that instruction might open a door to a relevant event or a relevant matter. So, for example, under the provisions uh, relating to an instruction that requires a change or resequencing of work or deferment of possession. And then if an employer refuses to deal with that request, there could be an argument that they've caused an impediment or default, again, opening a door to a relevant event or relevant matter. However, this isn't really a clear cut um, contractual requirement and I've yet to see it tested. Um, we expect, obviously, to see lots of amendments coming through dealing with time and cost implications of um, uh, material shortages. Um, I think the one thing we're seeing more and more now is contractors increasingly proposing to use the fluctuations provisions in contracts. JCT contracts provide an option in the contract particulars to allow the adjustment of rates, so that's the cost of materials, cost of labour, taxes, to deal with unforeseen changes in the price of materials which are needed to complete the works. And the threshold for the trigger is high. The price has to go beyond the sort of regular fluctuation that you see in the market, which I think is what we're really seeing now. Um, these provisions can be used in both fixed price and cost plus contracts. In the past, fluctuation provisions have been heavily resisted by employers. So everybody wants their fixed price lump sum, lump sum contract. However, I expect that they're going to gain in popularity um, because they enable a project to keep on track. They can protect cash flow, uh, prevent disputes and hopefully prevent contractors becoming insolvent, which is nobody's interest. It might also be worth the gamble, having the fluctuations provisions, um, as risk premiums um, sort of priced by contractors become too high. Under JCT contracts, there's also um, uh, another route that, uh, or another, uh, another area for negotiation, and that's the provisional sums provisions. So as you'll no doubt know, um, a provisional sum is usually included in a contract price as an estimate of the likely cost of work which is A, not sufficiently defined to be priced at the time that the contract is entered into, and or B, work that the employer may or may not um, choose to have undertaken. The price of works um, detailed by provisional sums is exactly that, it's provisional. It's generally accepted that as works proceed, the price will be adjusted accordingly, and the final contract price might be an increase or a decrease on the prices put in the provisional sums. Typically, however, under the JCT forms, the provisional sums form part of the scope of the works, so whether or not the provisional sum is defined and irrespective of the level of detail to which it's scoped or specified. 
So as a result, this is just a warning to all the clients and employers out there. If you subsequently decide to omit the provisional sum work and appoint another contractor to undertake it, you could in theory be placed, um, or sorry, be faced with a uh, breach of contract claim for loss of profit suffered by the original contractor. So if you're thinking about using provisional sums, have that at the back of your mind and uh, we can obviously amend your contracts to deal with that. Next slide, please. So looking at the other most commonly used um, form of contract, it is the NEC4 contract. And under this contract, contractors face exactly the same hurdle of establishing that a compensation event has um, occurred, which you will no doubt know um, isn't split into time or time and money events, um, but entitles a contractor to both time and money. As with the JCT suite, there is no express compensation event for material or labour shortages. So I'll look now at what's of, what options are available to a contractor. A contractor could try to claim if an instruction is received from a client under clause 611 in relation to the labour or materials. And if, a, um, if the labour and material shortages renders the scope requirements impossible, it has to be impossible to perform, the project manager under clause 17.2 must give an instruction to change the scope um, appropriately. But Impossibility is a really high threshold. Um, performance being more difficult or more costly is, is just not going to be enough. Um, as with the JCT contract, a contractor might seek to rely on the force majeure provisions. Um, under an NEC contract, force majeure is actually defined and it's an event that must stop or delay the works, be one that neither party could prevent, and also, it has to have had such a small chance of occurring that it would have been unreasonable for the parties to have allowed for it. So again, for any contracts being, being entered into now, the foreseeability element is likely to render this avenue void for a contractor. The industry-wide shortages have been known about for really some time now. NEC contracts also allow for various pricing options. So there's pricing options A through to E. Under options A and B, which I've got to say at the moment we see most commonly, the contractor assumes the risk of inflation, but under option C and D, that risk is shared between the parties. However, you should also note that risk allocation can be um, altered by secondary option clause X1. And X1, if chosen, allows for inflationary adjustments set against the latest price index. And that might, may allow a contractor to adjust the prices to allow for market volatility with regards goods and labour. There is no concept at all. I know we discussed provisional sums and JCT contracts, but there's no concept of that at all under NEC contracts. And that's on the basis that if an employer, if the client can't clearly define an aspect of the works at the time that the contract is entered into, that the work shouldn't be included because a contractor can't price and program for it. The preferred approach in the past has always been to add shortages to the early, um, early warning register. So that's really encouraging parties to mitigate those risks uh, listed and work together to do that. And I think that we're really in a time of crisis at the moment and that parties should be mindful of the general partnering approach of NEC contracts. You know, there's that overriding duty to act in a spirit of mutual trust and uh, cooperation. And I think that really bites if people feel like you know, there's a crisis going on. Um, I think that we're likely again to see compensation events being added to NEC contracts by way of Z clauses to deal with this issue going forward as the standard contract doesn't adequately deal with labour and material shortages. So in conclusion, um, I think we're sadly going to see a few more uh, company con uh, collapses. Many survived due to the emergency measures preventing winding up petitions during the pandemic. We've recently seen Midas go in the southwest and it's expected that more struggling firms will follow. And blame for these collapses partly lies with increasing costs and contractors' inability to um, staff 
um, staff projects to meet deadlines. Um, without wanting to sound too gloomy, um, this week the head of economics at the British Chamber of Commerce said that Russia's invasion of Ukraine um, has greatly increased our chance of a recession. Um, the US inflation I know hit 7.8% in February and um, I anecdotally I've heard that it's expected it's going to reach about 10 to 15% in the UK. So I don't think this problem is going to go away. Um, I think that we're going to see a lot more uh, negotiation around um, around this issue and I think there'll be a lot more clauses negotiated in by contractors in schedules of amendments um, and Z clauses in the NEC contracts. I also think that we're going to see very conservative tender returns when it comes to pricing and programming. Designers are really going to have to uh, think at an early stage about raw material availability and mitigating the risks of shortages you know, at the, from the earliest of design stages. Um, so how the risk is allocated and priced uh, needs to be discussed at negotiation and both the employer and contractor will need to be careful and very well advised about what they sign. Um, so I'd say that at the moment, the market position still remains generally that contractors take the risk, but I think we're going to see that shift slightly um, as employers realise that uh, fixed price lump sum contracts um, will come with a um, heavy risk premium. So I um, will now pass over to Sam. Sam is a director in our employment team and he's going to give you a construction focused look at managing staff absence. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. And it's, uh, I'm delighted to join you uh, today as the guest speaker on the construction uh, webinar. Um, and the references that I'm going to make uh, to the various legislation and practices are references in relation to English and Welsh law um, uh, and, and I know that we have as, as Stefan said we've got five out of seven continents represented um, so it may mean that there are little differences uh, from what you may be expecting if you are not based uh, currently within, um, within England or Wales. So managing staff absences um, I've got some um, statistics on the slide there uh, which uh, paint a pretty gloomy picture um, in that whilst the whole of the UK workforce and indeed the world is, is, is grappling with managing staff absences, the construction sector uh, within uh, the UK is particularly hard hitting uh, when it comes to managing staff absences in terms of the uh, number of absences but also in terms of the increasing prevalence of that within the within an organisation. And uh, particularly what is emerging is this uh, is the absence in relation to poor or deteriorating mental health for some uh, for some employees. Um, and so what we uh, need to uh, also focus on is that these statistics are taken from 2019 to 2020 pre-global pandemic. Um, which would have probably only got worse during the during the period of the global pandemic when people had to isolate and were poorly as a result of COVID. Um, whilst we might see that that might improve again, um, actually we are now hitting a second pandemic, as it's known, in terms of um, mental health and the impact of deteriorating mental health in, in the workplace. So it's something that employers need to be really um, focusing on. So obviously we are concerned primarily in relation to absence about the welfare of our employees and our staff um, but there's also a real a real hit on the on the bottom line ultimately um, and this is what makes us also want to try and tackle and manage these this issue um, effectively because with uh, manage with sickness absence we get lost time um, and that may be through accidents or, or injuries that have occurred um, or it may be uh, through musk mus musculoskeletal issues, I always have trouble saying that word, um, uh, or, or mental health issues as, we, as we're seeing. Um, and of course, there's a lot of management time that goes into dealing with staff absences and managing the legal risks around it, particularly where those uh, issues uh, that are being managed uh, concern disabilities, employees who have a health condition 
that meets the definition of a disability under the Equality Act. Um, so not all health conditions will be disabilities, uh, but uh, there's, there's quite a number that are. Um, and so uh, there's, some, there's some more stats on the slide there, and I would just, just give a bit of a trigger warning here. It paints a bit of a gloomy picture. Uh, there was a report by the Chartered Institute of Building uh, that found some quite depressing statistics in relation to um, uh, suicide uh, in young uh, men um, within, the, within the sector. And I won't dwell on, we'll dwell on that. Though. It'll be in the copy of the slides that will come out to you for you to read through. So it paints a, a, a bit of a gloomy picture. Uh, for us as a, as a sector. Um, so what can be done? What can we do to try and uh, proactively manage this issue of um, staff absence? Um, so there's some early interventions and, and they can really help. Very often the relationship with the line manager and the employee is absolute key to um, managing managing absence successfully uh, if as and when it may as and when it may occur but of course those line managers who are dealing with that need to be sufficiently trained and know what they are have got to do um, and of course particularly with mental health there's a lot of um, uncertainty about how best to manage it um, and, and so uh, there is a real drive uh, for people uh, for organizations who are procuring training in this particular area um, Many of you may have a sickness absence policy and that sickness absence policy may require the uh, employee to ring in sick and speak to the manager rather than send a WhatsApp or a text message or an email. And that can be really helpful to try and drive down uh, a lot of short term intermittent absences, because if you've got a good relationship with your line manager, and uh, you, you, you fancy taking a duvet day uh, on occasion, um, you are probably less likely to do so uh, if you would have to ring up and speak to that manager in question, uh, rather than just send um, a, a WhatsApp message, which is essentially a unilateral um, communication. And of course, managers need to be trained in how to deal with those kind of phone calls and what questions to ask um, uh, to, to, to best support the employee. So have a look at your policies as takeaway point to see if uh, we can uh, adjust those in any way in terms of reporting absence. Then we've got back to work interviews. So where employees have been off for a period of time, usually a week, so seven days, uh, you may say, well, no, you need to have a back to work interview. We are going to go through um, a, a pro forma questionnaire. And that can be very useful to an organization because not only does it force that conversation to take place between manager and employee about the reason for the absence, whether there's any support that can be put in place to try and prevent the absence occurring again, including any reasonable adjustments for any disabilities, but it can also be a good data gathering exercise to see where we are within the organization as to uh, the absence issue that we may have. Have we got a lot of mental health absences? Have we got a lot of long-term absences or short-term absences? Have we got a lot of persistent absences on Mondays and Fridays, for example? So um, the back to work interviews can be useful in, in gathering that, particularly within the construction sector where you have employees who may be working in, uh, on site um, and there isn't that kind of uh, management or HR sort of support on site, a pro forma back to work interview with guidance sitting alongside it can really help that manager. It's in their toolkit then to be able to have that uh, conversation with the employee in a meaningful way. And again, it helps build that build that relationship. Um, of course, I think the substance policy is always really helpful and, uh, and if it's detailed enough to give guidance to managers, again, that's really helpful and can try and prevent absences being followed, uh, sorry, absences being incurred. But of course, you have got to follow the policy itself. So it's no good having a, uh, a lovely shiny policy that gathers dust in the broom cupboard or somewhere on the internet that no one knows about. So very often uh, uh, we get asked to actually go in and deliver training to managers, to line managers on sickness absence policies, um, explaining what they are, getting the manager used to it, looking at how you would conduct back to work interviews, look at how you would manage disabilities within the workplace. Um, and, um, and that really helps to, to reduce uh, sickness absence and manage it effectively. Um, and then finally, 
you know, developing a good relationship with an occupational health provider, if you don't have one in-house, uh, can also be really useful uh, because they can provide um, le uh, medical advice on uh, the employee um, and the, the issues that they are, they are facing within their role because of any health condition that they may have. Now, for those of you who have engaged with occupational health before, um, you may share the view that a lot of a lot of clients have said to me over the years, well, occupational health only say what the employee tells them to say. And my response to that in speaking to a number of occupational health providers themselves is, well, you know, they don't know what an engineer does. They don't know what a labourer does. It's up to the employer, the line manager, to fully explain the nature of the role and fully explain the expectations and the operational difficulties of not having that employee uh, either in work or being able to work fully uh, within the role requirements. So um, don't allow the uh, not allowing the employee uh, occupational health to just repeat what the employee wants them to say. Um, put forward the operational impact that you you are experiencing uh, as an organisation and the full details of the role. Because you know I'm a lawyer. I trained as a lawyer. I've never been an engineer. I've never worked on a building site. Um, I I wouldn't necessarily know what these uh, roles actually fully uh, entail. So why would occupational health? And then the second thing that can be done, so as well as the early interventions, is to spot those high risk cases and to be able to manage them effectively uh, through um, a process. And of course, you're always managing uh, them through the process to try and rehabilitate them back into the workplace, to support them, to look after their health and safety needs and of course their health and safety needs of the organisation. Um, but it may be the case that in some situations, because of the work that they're doing, it's not going to be possible to rehabilitate them back into the workplace because of an illness or an injury that they may have. And of course, that needs to be managed um, uh, uh, effectively. So high risk cases. What are the high risk cases? Well, it tends to be where the individual has a health condition that amounts to a disability. And I have purposefully put a picture of a, of a wheelchair user on this slide here to illustrate the fact that when we think of somebody who has a disability, we may automatically think of somebody who is a wheelchair user who has a or who has a physical impairment. But actually, uh, the definition of a disability for the purposes of thinking about the workplace within within England and Wales is uh, much wider than that. And it's a physical or mental impairment which has a substantial adverse effect on a person's ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities, which is long-term or likely to be long-term. And I've put the uh, piece of law that that relates to there that you can always go and have a look at. And just pop that section uh, six, subparagraph one of the Equality Act 2010. Um, so I've highlighted the key elements of the health condition that would be examined to establish whether something is a disability um, or not in colour there. So we've got a, a physical or mental impairment, substantial effect on the person's ability to count normal data activities, which is long term. And when we say long term, we mean 12 months or more. And when we when we are applying this definition, we are applying it to an individual it, with the view that they would have no medication no treatment, no therapy to see whether this definition is met or not. So if you think of someone with uh, type 1 diabetes that is injecting themselves with uh, insulin uh, to, in, in order to carry on uh, their day-to-day -day activities, um, on the face of it, they can, can perform their activities very well. They can get up, they can get dressed, they can have a shower, they can make a meal, etc. But if you took that insulin away from them, they would very soon, soon find it very difficult to uh, carry out their normal day to day activities and that physical impairment would have an adverse effect on them. OK, so let's have a look at some other conditions here. Now, some of these are, are disabilities and some of them are not and some of them sit on the fence a little bit. So the ones highlighted in green there are expressly not disabilities. But the, just one thing to say on alcoholism, 
Um, very often, somebody who has an alcohol or drug or substance dependency uh, may well have another condition that doesn't amount to a disability, such as depression, for example. So we need to sometimes take a bit of a step back and look at the situation as a whole. And, 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 and that's where occupational health can advise, can advise you. Um, other conditions that are amber showing on the slide there may constitute disability, depending on how strongly they manifest themselves in that individual. And in those cases, you know, we're definitely going to be needing to take occupational health advice in order to make a determination as to whether someone is likely to be uh, meeting the definition of disability or not. And last but not least, the red ones um, are uh, uh, always going to constitute disabilities um, and within the meaning of that definition. And therefore, we need to manage those um, uh, effectively. So medical evidence is really, really important. And keeping that medical evidence up to date is very important as people go through treatments for illnesses, conditions, diseases, etc. Um, and it's, those of you who um, are, are familiar with um, the provisions of the Equality Act will know that it is unlawful for an employer uh, or indeed anybody else to discriminate against uh, somebody on the basis of uh, them having a disability. Um, and the, the four uh, uh, types of discrimination listed there are probably set out within your equality and diversity policy. Uh, and and I, won't, I won't dwell on what they, what they all mean for the purposes of today. But the last one there on uh, failure to make reasonable adjustments, I just want to highlight because I think this is a really, really key area where we can help reduce uh, sickness, sickness absence. So if an employer, if an employee has a disability that puts them at a disadvantage, the employer is obliged to make reasonable adjustments for that individual in relation to how they are performing their work, their terms and conditions, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, some typical reasonable adjustments uh, are set out within the um, Equality and Human Rights Commission website, that's the EHRC website, um, and that's a really accessible document and really authoritative document on what reasonable adjustments uh, that there may be. But we're thinking about alterations of duties, phased return to work, changing hours, etc. The, the key though for an employer is it's not any adjustment that has to be made. It has to be a reasonable adjustment. And it has to be reasonable for the employer to make it and it has to meet the um, removal of their disadvantage that the employee is suffering from. So sometimes there can be a bit of a battleground over it. And um, always speak to occupational health though about um, reasonable adjustments and they would be able to help and advise you and steer you in the right direction. Um, Car bear traps. Uh, it, it, in relation to managing disabilities or, 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 or managing sickness health absence generally is doing nothing. You know, that, that, that causes a problem because very often uh, things that could easily be nipped in the bud quite quickly um, are not um, and communications break down and employees can become uh, more sort of entrenched in their, in their sort of disgruntlement for the organisation or, or for that manager. So it's really important to be proactive about managing uh, sickness absence. Um, failing to make adjustments when there is an obligation to do so, so we need to be thinking very carefully about that. Um, so amending roles and moving employees to light duties, um, but also removing those reasonable adjustments as well when necessary. And of course, you will be led through the process with occupational health um, advising and updating as, as you go. Not making the business case clear as to why you can't cope with the adjustments. So um, within within employment law and within this particular area of employment law, it's a bit of a balancing act between what the employee needs and what the employer needs to be able to operate um, in, a, in, in an efficient and commercial way. And often there's a lot of focus um, on the uh, employee's problems uh, rather than the employer's problems. So um, make sure you are clear uh, with the impact operationally on how that um, is impacted. Um, and lack of awareness in, and managers in, in terms of managing mental health, the inability to have a conversation, um, which is quite uh, uh, which is quite common. And again, training can can assist with that. Um, and not informing occupational health of the bigger picture, I've already covered that one. Um, what does an engineer actually do? Um, and what is their role and how is their disability impacting on their ability to do it? 
um, and, and as I said, failure to train managers on issues and process. So don't take action, don't take absence records at face value. Is there a pattern? Could there be a disability? Do we need to get occupational health advice and do we need to keep that updated um, as time goes on? And are your managers actually equipped to manage these issues effectively, proactively, uh, and in a way that improves the bottom line, but also staff welfare? Um, and you may be surprised to know, you may know already, that Burkitt's do offer some training in this area, and this is a shameless plug on my part, uh, but we do have a course for managers uh, aimed at managing ill health and disability, uh, uh, and we have a number of other courses as well uh, that all cover this type of uh, area. And we're delighted to, uh, that last year we became an approved training provider for the Engineering Construction Industry Training Board. And what that means is that um, some of our training courses could be offered to you, could be provided to your line managers, um, and that the, the, you, you can get support for or grant funding towards that. So the ECITB would pay um, money to you uh, to help towards the cost of that training. And that is if you are what's called an in-scope employer with the ECITB. So if you pay a levy to the ECITB, then you are likely to be an in-scope employer. And if you want any more details about what might be able to be offered, then um, do contact us after the session today. Um, that brings me to an end of my little, little slot. Um, please feel free to raise any questions um, and we'll hopefully deal with them in the Q&A session. But without further ado, I will pass over to uh, Stephen, who's going to take us through a case law update. Thank you. Hi there. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, good morning, folks. My name is Stephen Williams and I'm a solicitor here in the construction and engineering team at Burkitt's. And this morning, I have the pleasure to talk to you about some recent case law updates um, affecting the sector. Now, I'll be swift because I know we've had a lot of questions that have come in. Um, but I'm happy to pick up any any things that um, any clarifications uh, during the Q&A. So the three different topics I'll be discussing this morning are firstly um, bringing a court claim when there are outstanding adjudication decisions. Secondly, an important case case on claims between contractors and homeowners. And thirdly, is a case about cladding, and it's all about when to amend your claim. So about further ado, we'll move over to, to the first issue then, which is about um, claims and adjudication decisions. And this was the case of our RHP and Treforest. Uh, Trefor uh, RHP was the contractor and Treforest was the employer. And as you'll see, there were two adjudications in, in this case. The first one, RHP, the contractor was ordered to pay some money to £264,000. And in the second adjudication, um, Treforest was ordered to pay some money, £223,000. Um, now, interestingly, in this case, neither adjudication decision was was settled. Um, so they, they it remained on the books, if, if you like. Neither party had made payment, but it won't take a mathematical genius to work out that um, what what results, the net result of those two, two adjudications is that um, Treforest is, is owed money. Now, with these outstanding adjudications decisions, RHP issued a claim against Treforest. Um, Treforest applied for a stay until it was paid the money because it said the net result is we're owed some money. Um, and it, it sought to therefore uh, stay the claim on the basis of, of the pay now and argue later principle. And I'll talk to you about that in just a moment. But what the stay would have meant in, in turn, what it would have actually meant was that the proceedings were paused until RHP made payment um, within X number of days. And if RHP didn't make that payment, the claim, the claim would be struck out. RHP said, no, you can't stay the claim. We have a right to access justice um, and therefore um, that order shouldn't be made. So if we move over to the next slide, we can see how the courts um, grappled with these issues. So, as I as I previously mentioned, the, the pay now and argue later principle. I want to talk, I want to talk to you mainly about the first two points on on the um, what, what the court had to consider. So, the key one is the pay now and argue later principle. 
And that effectively means that you must comply with an adjudication decision, adjudicator's decision, subject to jurisdiction and natural justice issues, which I'll, I'll leave to one side because they, they are the exception. So you must comply with the decision, even if you're unhappy with the result. This is because adjudication decisions are binding but temporary, which means although you must comply with them, they can be overturned at a later stage in court proceedings. Um, now, the the principle, the first principle up there is the access to access to justice, i.e. the right to access the court. Now, you can see how these two principles conflict, because broadly speaking, you have to pay what the adjudicator has awarded in order to then go on and argue later. So your right to access the court is conflicted. Um, now, the court weighed up in this instance what they thought the right thing to do, bearing in mind the conflicted right, conflicting right and the conflicting principle and said there was no reason why RHP had not paid the balance, the net result that was owed to them, um, which was £36,494. So the, the court did award, uh, did, did stay the proceedings and say that unless the payment is made within 28 days, the claim would be struck out. And I, I say that this case is, a, is an important reminder that you can't just ignore adjudicated decisions. <clears throat> short, of, short of the challenges of uh, jurisdiction or natural justice issues, the principle of pay now, argue later, um, really is the general rule, you know, subject to those, those exceptions. Um, and this case is, is an important reminder of that. So if we move over to the next slide now, we'll, we'll move on to uh, an important case about <clears throat> claims concerning homeowners. So in this case, uh, Sky's the Limit was the contractor and Dr. Mohammed Mirza was, was the homeowner. <clears throat> Now, I mean, the, the underlying background really is nothing, um, nothing extraordinary because um, it's, it's a case, case of works carried out at a, at a residential property. Um, I, I, that nothing there, nothing there is, is out, is out of ordinary. It's, it's a fairly, fairly normal project, but it transpired to be a spectacularly unfruitful piece of litigation for everyone involved. Um, and in short, the contractors brought claims against uh, the homeowner for unpaid amounts. And the defendant homeowner said that on a true value, there were no sums due um, because because of, um, you know, because of the value of the works, rectifications that needed to be carried out, etc. Um, now, the court showed great concern about this type of case um, and said there's always a risk in these types of cases where neither party would end up gaining, but both would end up spending a significant amount in terms of costs. Um, and the court took a very proactive approach in this case saying that measures should be in place to help avoid this situation um, and those me those those measures heavily involve the courts encouraging you to settle more more so i say than they already already do um, now what happened in this case was actually uh, unfruitful of, as i said because the result was a nil amount was due to either party and they incurred a significant amount in costs and that's why the court um, placed emphasis on, on settlement and the court said notwithstanding the emphasis on settlement the court said that it is of course the function of the court to resolve disputes where the parties are unable to do so however I'm acutely aware that so often occurs in this type of case the outcome will likely be a financial disaster for one of the parties and even if not likely an expensive and ultimately unrewarding result for both so let's move to the next slide now and we'll look to see what the court said needed to take place The court said that uh, as, a compulsory, uh, as a compulsory point that there should be directions at the CCMC, which is uh, the first stage in which the court really takes a proactive um, role in how the, the court claim will be conducted. So the, the directions for the CCMC should say at the very least that there should be disclosure limited to documents that are relied on um, and to known adverse documents, so documents that adversely affect your case. There should be a single joint expert building surveyor instructed in all cases to address liability, um, valuation and quantum. Um, and, and any questions to the expert should be should be limited. There should then be a stay for mediation on receipt of the report and, and, um, and questions being put to the expert. If the parties are, are not willing to mediate um, or, or they've mediated, then the court said that there should be a compulsory early neutral evaluation before another TCC judge. Um, and what that means is that another TCC judge will look at 
the limited information and evidence available because the court was saying it should be restricted to save costs and he'll give a an early indication or an early view on what he or she thinks um, how the case might might pan out if it once it goes to trial now if settlements not the, the purpose of that is to, is to focus minds so if if a judge gives an early view on how how the case might go once it, how the case might be resolved at trial that focuses minds and helps the parties um, reconsider their position and ultimately uh, hopefully re reach settlement if that doesn't work the court will then give further directions in order to streamline the process um, and really make it more of a summary process to keep costs at a minimum now the judge said that it would this process would be fair um, and it is unlikely that it is unlikely that a more intensive and thus more lengthy and expensive trial process would produce a result significantly different to the result produced by um, this procedure so is it a big change i think it potentially is um, it's a significant change in the way homeowner claims are conducted um, and although none of this is new it's an indication that the courts are now going to take a, a much more proactive role in it to ensure in ensuring that homeowner claims are resolved um, proportionally um, so it's potentially it's potentially a big uh, big change so if we move over to the next slide now it's um the final topic i want to talk to you about today and i will move quickly um because i want to get to the q a um, so this is the case of malawley and martlett i mentioned it's about cladding issues um and martlett was the owner of uh, five high-rise tower blocks uh, malawley was the dmb contractor and these claims were were all about um allegations concerning you know, inadequate workmanship and designs relating to the, the fire protection provided by the stow system now the defense was raised on the basis that the um the presence of combustible eps insulation within the stow system wasn't prohibited prohibited at the time of the contracts now this necessitated an amendment to the claim because the claim didn't deal with this particular point which was more of a design issue um, ultimately the court awarded permission for the claim to, for, for martlett to amend its claim um, and the court said that whilst it would result in a fresh action amending the claim would result in a fresh action um, the the amendment was so similar in terms of the facts that were already an issue it, it was permissible now malawley appealed and said that it, it's wrong to conclude that the new claim arises out of the, you know the same or substantially the same facts now in truth malawley malawley appealed that because if it was held that um if it was held that the judge shouldn't have allowed the the amendment then that part of the claim would have been statute barred which ultimately would have been would have been a disaster so on appeal on appeal then the court of the, the court decided the court looked at what what the judge needed to consider and had the had the judge considered this right at first instance so let's look at what the judge had to consider in the in the next slide so the first issue was was this a was this a new claim um, and the, the the amendment was all about design because uh, because Malawley was the designer and therefore specified the materials used. Um, the court said that this was a new claim because it was a contingent claim. The amendment focused on design choices uh, rather than the implement implementation of the design, um, and the essential facts alleged are different. So it was a it was a new claim, but that doesn't that doesn't bar it that doesn't bar the amendment. Um, if if the if the issues in the amendment are the same or substantially similar facts, that will allow it. So the court then went on to address that. Um, ultimately, the court said these are these were similar facts, and the court looked at those three reasons on on the slide there. The first was that the selection of combustible insulation claim um, merely identified a further reasons for the replacement of the stow system um, the second was that there was an overlap between the case that was originally pleaded on workmanship and design albeit that the, the previous uh, the original claim was em emphasizing workmanship and now the amended case was focusing on design and the third and final point was that selection of combustible materials flows naturally from the way in, in which malawley malawley pleaded its case um, so um, ultimately, uh, Martlett was allowed to allowed the amendment, and the, the case proceeded, which was great news. 
Um, this would have been a disaster had it not been allowed because limitation would have presented uh, prevented that claim being an issue, um, which could have had you know terrible terrible consequences for Martlet. Um, so keep an eye on limitation is my is my pointer for this one. Um, and if you if you amend, make sure you know you make a timely application. But for now, I know we're close on time, so I'll give you back to uh, Mr. Harris Wright to take you through uh, to lead the Q and A. Thanks, Stephen. I'll just wait a moment whilst our panelists come back to join us. There they all are. Great. Um, excellent. Well, I hope you've, you found that interesting. We have got some time for questions and questions have been coming in. So without further ado, I will launch into those and I'll try and go in the same order as our as our speakers um, appeared. Uh, and so, Sophie, there's one for you here, which has come in uh, from a main contractor. And the question is, uh, should labour and materials shortages be treated as relevant events when amending JCT standard forms? Oh, well, hopefully I've already answered that in um, what I've just spoken about. Um, of course, it um, depends on the negotiated position and the risk allocation within a contract. Um, generally, availability of labour and materials shortages um, is a contract risk, so not a relevant event allowing time or relevant matter allowing time and money, unless, of course, another relevant event or relevant matter bites for example, it's caused by force majeure, war, employer instruction, etc. Um, but as I've said, I think we're probably going to see the market position change as the risk premiums become too high um, and contractors are unwilling to price for fixed contracts. Um, and of course, it's in everyone's interest that contractors don't go insolvent. Um, so as I've just said, I expect that um, shortages and price um, rises as they become unbearable we may see employers positions softening excellent thank you Sophie Sam I'll come to you uh, there is a question here um, which is what happens if you have an employee who says they have health issues but you think they're just trying to get out of doing the difficult jobs or the jobs that they don't like yeah, and that that is a, a a common thing that can that can occur, and it's a um, so maybe that is a cynical view, but it, it does actually happen in reality. Ultimately, they they are they're employed to do a job, they're employed to do the, the, the full remit of that job. If they're saying they've got health issues that prevent them from being able to do it, then get them off to occupational health and get that get that resolved. But before you maybe go to occupational health, you may actually just sit them down and say, what is it that's the problem? Um, you know, you have a duty of care towards them to make sure that you aren't putting their health into jeopardy. So you can do you can do that. But if you think you've got a malingerer on your hands, uh, then send them off to occupational health and they'll come back with a, with a full bit of health. And if they do, uh, then it's down to a performance issue and you've got to manage that through a performance process. Excellent. Thank you, Sam. Stephen, one for you. Um, about homeowner claims you talked about that case on this point so the question is uh, is it now more difficult to bring a claim against a homeowner uh, not necessarily more difficult but as I, as I mentioned i think that we can now expect the court to make uh, to take more of a proactive role in, in how the case will will be run um and that might be a change but not necessarily a difficulty but ultimately that's why we're here um, to assist was to assist with that sort of thing so um yeah we, we can certainly um certainly steer people through uh, steer contractors through that that change Excellent. thank you stephen uh, sophie back to you here there's one about slow progress so from an architect actually i'm having problems with very slow progress on building projects and taking ages to make good defects etc any advice please um yeah i think the best advice i can give is to make sure that provisions in your contract have teeth you know uh, money focuses minds um so take advantage of liquidated damages provisions so obviously allowing defined damages to be uh, levied for late performance um use the retention provisions you know allowing that about three or five percent to be withheld um until practical completion or making good defects um, you can also include provisions in your contract, in your schedule of amendments, 
um, allowing the client or the employer to employ others to rectify defects if the contractor doesn't. Um, and then the sums expended doing that can be recovered um, as a debt or taken out of the retention. Um, Otherwise, best advice is good project management, you know, service of, no, uh, of notices, um, engagement with the contractor, those all sort of play an important part. Um, and I'd also urge you to sort of, you know, seek our advice if you can see things going wrong, because one of the best things that, um, uh, one of the cheapest ways to avoid a dispute is to head it off before it actually happens. Good stuff. Thank you, Sophie. Sam, back to you. I think we've got time for one more question for Sam and one more for Stephen, and then I'll wrap up. So, Sam, question here on occupational health, which is that um, occupational health and GPs are not very good at providing proper information and always side with the employee. Um, this is the view. Uh, how can I address this? Yeah, and I hear that view a lot. Um, and the best way you can address it is, as I was saying, um, in, in, in the session just a bit earlier, um, tell occupational health um, and, the, and, and, or, and or the GP the full remit of the role and don't leave it to the employee to go into that, occupation, that, that, that meeting room, sit down and allow them to tell the GP or occupational health physician what the, their, their role is and what they do. You provide that information, you provide a job description, of course, if it's up to date, and any other supplemental information. And if you're, if you're still um, not getting what you need from occupational health, ask for a meeting and go for a meeting with the manager and the employee where you all sit down and you make it clear, very clear what the, what the situation is. Um, and, um, you know, or change provider. Um, Yep. Good stuff. All right. Thank you, Sam. Uh, so last question, conscious of time, but uh, time for one more for you, Stephen, uh, just to even things up. So question here about the interaction between court claims and adjudication, uh, which is, can you bring a court claim with an outstanding adjudication decision? So fr from the case we discussed, RHP and Treforus, I think it's, it's, it's relatively clear that now I think that the pay now argue later principle remains the general rule um, and that you must therefore comply with an adjudicated decision before um, you, you can you can essentially argue later in court now there there are exceptions to that and and that is uh, you know jurisdictional issues and natural justice issues and that those are things we can advise on they may not be present in every case but they're things that you should always um, you should always look out for um, because that may be the exception to the rule Fantastic. Thank you, Stephen. OK, well, it's a little bit after 12, so we've kept almost the time, but uh, that's probably all we've got time for this morning. Uh, I hope you found the session uh, useful and interesting. Um, the dates for the rest of our quarterly 2022 webinars are going to be published on LinkedIn and our website in the coming weeks. So please do uh, look out for those. And just to wrap things up, when, when the session ends, you will be invited to submit your feedback. And that includes an opportunity to make suggestions for things you want to hear about from us in, in future sessions. So if you're able to take a minute to do that exercise, we'd be very grateful. That's always really useful uh, feedback for us. Um, so all that remains for me to say is thank you once again very much for joining us. Have a good day and uh, we hope to see you next time. <laughs>